today we're going to proceed from the church fathers through the modern time. <laughs> now that was a feat that caused half of the bottle of, of pills. Um, so what I did for you is I just gave you an outline, okay, on one of your sheets. One side says Old Testament, New Testament, Second Temple period. We're going to go over some of that. I didn't fill it in for you because then you'd be reading it and I wouldn't need to be here. <laughs> um, and then the other side um, starts um, with another time period. I have it in and so that's so that you know where we're going to go. I cannot repeat last week. So if you haven't seen it, it is on the church YouTube. Um, I just, there isn't the time uh, to do that. So last week we spent trying to define what evil is. That's still left open. At the end of next Sunday, it will still be left open. And there's a good reason for it, and we'll get to that uh, next week. Okay? And so, I need to tell you that whatever you did in graduate school, college, about the historical eras that I'm going to cover today. I'll be a little bit like Moby Dick of last week. Um, you'll know more than me. But the point is the shifts that take place in the construct of evil. That's what we're looking at. And you'll see the arrow on the bottom of one of your sheets that shows what we're doing. We're looking at, over time, the construct of evil, there's a line. We're looking at the rise of consciousness, of knowledge and awareness of who we are, of our situations in life. And then at the very bottom, you see an arrow going in the opposite direction, and it's called hindsight. And that arrow is because, for the most part, we know evil by looking back. And we talked about that last week, the massacre of Indians in the name of the gospel, etc. We look at the time, great slavery at the time, great. And then we look back and we say, wow, but that was evil. Okay, so that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. That we're moving forward in consciousness as situations change through history, through culture, through experience. And the construct or the idea of evil, does it change? Does it change? Can it be more clearly uh, defined? So right now, I'm going to do my whisk through everything um, to get to those shifted points. Um, I was uh, uh, noted by Bill to look at uh, the page you're looking at now, which has the testaments on it, that at the bottom it says, the horizontal lines um, our shifts, um, but I think it's it is the vertical lines um, that are our shifts. And if I know as much about vertical and horizontal as I do about Moby Dick, we're doing really well. <laughs> we'll, we'll get through the whole thing without too many mistakes. Okay, so what I want to want to go back to and start with really is where we left off and with the Swiss cheese, and that that's here because. I want you to see what sterile, unfeeling theories of evil look like. They all look like Swiss cheese, of one way or another. So Augustine is the one, although all ideas seem to precede all the people who seem to claim credit for them, and then there's one that makes a big deal of it and gets the credit. And so he's not the first to think of evil as the absence of good. This is good, this is actually God, there's all there is is good, God created it, creation. And so evil, because it's not an entity, because it's not God, because it's not a separate deity, is in fact the absence of good. And the flaw of this, I think, um, can, be, can be really readily seen. The flaw of this is, if evil keeps chewing away at good, and good disappears, evil destroys itself. 
because when all you're left with is holes, you're left with nothing. So it's a nice idea. Most theories are nice, but they don't get into the, the, the flesh and blood of suffering that people go through. And that's what really matters. The suffering you've gone through with disease or with somebody who's done something terrible to you, um, it doesn't get into the flesh and blood of the experience of it. So we have to keep in mind theories are theories. And this is what theories look like. They have a lot of holes in them, even if it's not just Augustine. So let's go to Augustine again and look at Adam and Eve. Just briefly, again, everything will be brief so we can move forward. So Adam and Eve, um, the, 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 take, the eating of the fruit, which we think is an apple, but it's not. It's, it's really a bunch of grapes. We just didn't read it right. Um, so the fruit that was eaten was Eve's fault. It was the serpent who tempted her, but she did it. And then there's many, many theories. I mean, this Adam and Eve stuff and sin and how we look at it goes through the centuries, through denominations. There is a myriad of stories about Adam and Eve because they're the first human beings. And so Augustine said it was the woman's fault. Now, it's really clear that you should hear that. It's not just they sinned, but it's her fault. The serpent was evil. You will not find that in Genesis. The serpent is evil. Eve is tempted. She gives in, and the reason that the serpent goes to Eve is that Adam's too strong to give in to temptation. <laughs> And so when Adam sins, it's because the woman did what to make him sin? Well, use your imagination. <laughs> That's said enough, right? So this idea that you should know, before Augustine, through Augustine, to other church fathers, and I have it on a handout I'm not going to give you yet. I, it'll be as you leave, because I don't want you, where well, there's a naked woman with a snake around her. And I know some of you will be... Um, absorbed in that for the entire hour. <laughs> so we'll wait to the end for you to have the naked woman with the snake. But you get the idea, don't you? Tertullian said, and he's early, one of the first church fathers, that all women are Eve. Okay, so it's, it's not a very nice thing. And we know it, don't we? I mean, the whole issue of human rights, civil rights, equal rights. Today it still follows us from uh, centuries ago, millennium ago. But the other thing that, that, um, that Augustine did, and it's not in scripture this way, scripture says once they sinned, God said you'll have to labor in fields and you'll labor in birth. And Augustine carried that full way, and he said, their sin corrupted nature and all humanity and creation. Everything is not good. Everything is corrupted. And we can blame it on the first parents. And he calls that the original sin. There was an original sin. You know the term, don't you? Because we all sort of believe in original sin as Christians. Just so you know, it comes from Augustine. Original sin. And it's in our baptism. We, we are baptized uh, to take away that old Adam. It should be the old Adam and Eve, I guess. Maybe the old Eve, huh? Like, that would have been worse. But then I want you to see how Adam and Eve were looked at um, by Judaism. So here, and I guess I can use the word concupiscence. You know what concupiscence is. It's that sexual thing um, and lust. And, and this is how original sin gets transmitted. So those of us who never have sex, we're good. We're good. <laughs> At least we're not carrying the disease throughout, you know, infecting um, the rest of us with sin. So here's how uh, Judaism still looks at 
um, Adam and Eve. That there is, this word ha means the, yetzer is inclination. So the evil, ra, hara, yetzer. Yetzer hara means evil inclination. Yetzer ha, mazel tov. Good and the good inclination, which means that you have two inclinations and you choose. You choose. There is the idea that goes deeper that it's very difficult not to choose evil. There is a strong inclination, but you can still choose. And it goes on in their scriptures, choose life. Choose, you choose, it's free will. In fact, some stories go far enough to say, how else can you be, um, can you actually grow and become a human being unless you leave the darn garden? Till you leave home and take some responsibility. So how do you get your kid to do the opposite of what you want? You forbid them. <laughs> <laughs> and then they do, they just do what they want and God says, finally, you guys are just living in this luxury. And these are the two people, the only two people of all existence who had the choice not to sin. Think about that. I can't even imagine that. So you have original sin, which has carried through to, I don't know how many denominations. We have so many denominations, I have no clue how many believe in original sin. And then the Yetzer HaRa, Yetzer HaTov. So that's really an important thing. And then we're going to jump, because we did the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures last week. Remember that? Do you remember that we read the scripture as well? Um, let's see. So I just show that so we can keep some continuity. That there was not a problem of evil in the Old Testament. While there's Satan, while there's the devil, those words meant advocate accuser. In fact, God is a Satan to other people in the scripture. So that's very interesting. God is a Satan. And that's how it's worded in the Hebrew scriptures. But it doesn't mean that God was evil. It means that God was an adversary or a stumbling block. Why is God a stumbling block? It's going to leave that question open. Why? Is evil necessary? Does God play a part in our stumbles, in our actions? Does God intervene in some way? So the devil is not necessary because, and the scripture I handed out for you last week does it, and then we're done with the last week, and that scripture is that um, God says himself, there is no other but me, I make wheel and row, I create good and bad. There is only one God. So it's not a problem of evil. There's evil in the scripture, but it's not a problem. There's not a theodicy. How do we resolve this? It's not as God all powerful. It's not this modern day stuff. It's God is God. That's all there is. He's responsible for everything. Okay? You can have all kinds of questions. You're not the only one just to put it that way. So we're going to jump then from Augustine, from the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, we can call it also the First Testament, and we're going to uh, move to Job really quickly. I mentioned Job last week, and I'm not going to say any more about it, except from the pre-exilic, that means pre-exile, the Jews went into exile in Babylonia for about 70 years. Apparently, and that's all the further I could get, because looking up to stuff <laughs> doesn't get you very far, okay? And I'm looking for answers where there are none. So I need to tell you that too. Uh, so we go from, from pre-exilic, which is the first temple period, Solomon and David, okay, to exile in Babylonia, where a lot of the Jews, after they can come back, a lot are born, some are 40 at the time, they come back 70 years, some come back, some don't, and those that come back have an experience of exile, which is traumatic for some. 
and integrative for others. How long, O oh Lord, we read in the Psalms, will we be kept back from Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, if I forget you. You know, these kinds of, of things come up. And so what happens is no one quite knows when the book of Job was written. But it's pretty much agreed upon by scholars. And that doesn't mean much either. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really doesn't. It's, it's like... It's like the medicine you're taking now, and 10 years later, it's not what they said it was. And that's how this works with scholars as well. Um, and it does. Um, and, and that's why I date everything in my books. I have books that I've dated 1991, what day and month, because if these people would have just put a date on their books, we would know something. And it's, it's the biggest sore that I have with, when did they write that, and when did they write that? But no one knows when Job was written, but because Satan is now personalized, there's the assumption that there was some Babylonian influences. And there is the Babylonian theodicy, so things I can't get in, but there are, there are things and texts uh, and mythologies that the Jews learned in exile that probably filtered in then to Jewish thinking. And so Job is really an anomaly because there's not a problem of evil until Job brings it up. So he's probably post-exilic, even though he's in the scriptures. And that's important to note. We can say, oh, but Satan is in the, the Hebrew scriptures. Yes, the devil is, yes, but at a certain time period. So that's why I've got some things outlined for you there. So what we have here is Satan, but Satan is not evil in the book of Job. Satan is kind of like, get over here, Satan. I have a job for you. So you might say that God has Satan. Now, we can get later and say that's the dark side of God. Hmm? The doubting God, the testing God. But anyway... God has Satan do his dirty work. So we see that with the book of Job. Now, again, is that a separate being? It, was, it isn't said to be. It isn't said to be a separate being. But he's asked to test Job in the most horrific way. The death of all of his children, all of his cattle, and everything. And the question comes up, um, and it's still written about today, isn't it? Um, Harold Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, central theme, the book of Job. It keeps coming up. Who is God? What is God's purpose in allowing Satan? Is God all good? Is God all powerful? Is God everywhere? If God is, why didn't he stop this? Or why, when things really don't get so bad, like the exodus, he doesn't intervene? These are the questions that get raised. They're not answered. Well, they're answered. That's a problem, too, that they're answered. Krishna will answer that question. But there's a problem with answering the question of evil as well. We'll get into that next week. So here's the question. God, why have you let this happen to me? I've been good. So bad things do happen to good people. You're not just given the blessings of the pre-exilic, which are you do good and life will be long and you'll be prosperous. Okay, there's that idea. Okay, so are you with me? Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, problems, boring yet? We'll try not to do that. Okay, so let's go to your sheet again. And we're going to look at the second temple period. Those of you who have not been with me during any lectures, you need to know that in Judaism, and there Jesus was Jewish, the first followers were Jewish, so we place Jesus within Judaism. And he lives during the second temple. I mean, he went and overturned the tables of the temple. He worshiped in the temple. His parents found him there at 12 years old. So the temple is there, and his theology is not Christian, his theology is Jewish. 
Second Temple Judaism, which is why I try to teach, let's look at Jesus' comments from a Jewish perspective, um, and not verses, but in addition to some of our interpretations. And so we're going to look at what is called the late Second Temple period, which is where Jesus is, and where Antiochus Epiphanes is. Now, in my lectures on the kingdom of God, I get into that extensively. It's also on YouTube. I don't know if all the previous YouTubes are. They are. They're on the church site. So in the kingdom of God, you'll find a whole thing of Antiochus Epiphanes. What it's really all about is that he's a, a Greek king over Samaria and Judea. And his name means God manifest. And he wants the Jews to worship him. And they won't. And so the big story gets summarized very quickly. He, you know, he, he does a, a, a blasphemy to the temple. He rededicates it to Zeus. He puts a pig on the altar. He doesn't allow the Torah to be read in Judea Samaria. He wants all Torahs burnt, sound familiar? All the Torahs burnt, and again, there's not the printing press. You burn a Torah, you've burned two, three years of work. They're not easy to replace. Even today in synagogues, these things, these Torah scrolls, they're not prints. They're all hand done, and they cost thousands of dollars. Okay, so important, because we're gonna get we're gonna get to books a little bit later. So what happens is we know about Antiochus through the book of Daniel, which is an apocryphal book. Uh, Daniel is seen as not that, but what he talks about is Antiochus. And he gives the whole story in the book of Daniel of what's going on. And what's going on is it's a warring time. The zealots are fighting uh, the, the Greeks and the, and the, the Romans. And the, so there's warfare, there's upheaval everywhere, and then this happens with the temple, and there's outright war. Bring in the Maccabees and bring in Hanukkah. Okay, so Hanukkah, the lighting of the candles, the retaking of the temple, is part of Antiochus Epiphanes. What is important here is you see a battle of good and evil. That's what's going on here. And Daniel realizing the Jews might just lose and that they will be defeated and evil will win says, well, don't worry too much about it. And this is where we get it from. There's the introduction of the resurrection. Daniel says, it's okay, there'll be justice after. And here is where we get our own concept, and Jesus gets it too, of the resurrection of the dead, where finally justice will take place. And evil will be defeated, but not here. Okay, and then we have, I have other things here, the book of Enoch, just to let you know, we don't know from the New Testament the origins of evil or the nature of evil. Jesus doesn't tell us, Paul doesn't tell us. We're not gonna to get too much into Paul. We're gonna stick with Jesus today. I like that, I think. And, um, and where we get the idea of angels and demons and devil in our Gospels is from the book of Enoch. And I have to tell you, I've never read the book of Enoch, so now I've bought it. It's an apocryphal book. It's in the Ethiopian Bible. It was read and referenced by all the church fathers. So it was widely read. And this is where the ideas of our, it's full of demonology and angelology. It's a weird story of how the angel fell um, and the, the angel started having sex with human women and the birth of, of, of this was giants and it's a, it's a crazy story. Um, but there it is, there's Lucifer. So the book of Enoch influenced early Christianity. So if you're wondering where does it come from, I wondered. That was a week of this, finding out, oh, the book of Enoch. Okay, that's where all of this comes from. So we don't have to ask it anymore. It, it doesn't have an origin um, or a nature that we can go back to its source. Okay, and that's important. Then you have the Essenes during this time, they're fed up with Jerusalem, they're fed up with 
um, Judaism, they're Jewish, they head off to Qumran at the Dead Sea, they're the ones who hide all the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay, and they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls something very interesting. They found a scroll called the Two Spirits. So here we have this dualism still, good and evil, warfare, and, and it is the Essenes then who talk about the sons of deceit and the sons of truth. The sons of defeat are evil of deceit are evil, so we have lying here, deceit. Okay, it's really important. It will come up again. And then um, and they are the children of darkness. So we have dark now, juxtaposed again with the spirit of light, or the spirit of God. So just to keep that in mind. Okay, how are we doing here? Oof, do you do? We were 10 minutes late, by the way. So can we stay till quarter after? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, pardon? I think it was five minutes, so um, quarter after it takes five. So let's go now to the New Testament, to the Gospels. You have a lot of text here. We're going to go through part of it now and part of it at the end. So, as Jay was saying in his wonderful sermon uh, today, and it was very good again, I like being back here and taking notes. It's really, it's, it's really nice. Um, what does evil mean in the Gospels? Jesus never defines it. He never talks about the source. He never talks about defeating the devil or Satan. But we see Jesus healing. So I have the first two texts. Let's look at those. So I didn't put whole text. We couldn't fit them all in. So in Luke, and ought not this woman, the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, so she couldn't stand up straight. And he set her free from bondage on the Sabbath day. That Sabbath day is a different issue. But the point is, he healed her. And she could stand up. So it's physical healness. He made her whole physically. And the next one, Luke 4, there was a man with a, an unclean demon. A spirit of an unclean demon. We don't know what that is, do we? We think of it as demon-possessed, devil-possessed. <coughs> In that age, they didn't... Uh, really have mental illnesses, um, and, and this demon speaks out, have you come to destroy us? Who are you? And Jesus rebukes him, saying, be silent and come out of him. So we see exorcisms, or healing again, of maybe not something so physical as something really mental or spiritual. So we see Jesus, and there's a lot of Jesus healing. Oh, I have a picture here. Um, by the way, thanks to Claire Pace who did all of these um, for us and all the handouts. Printed all the handouts and is taking the video and lives with me, <laughs> which she now regrets. <laughs> so, pardon? Um, I can't hear, so it's part of my age. What did you say? I just said, it's her turn for the Advil. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, she can't take that. It's a physical thing. <laughs> just to take a leave. That doesn't do the job. Trust me, that's right. Okay, so the Gospels, evil is prominent. That's important. Satan is mentioned 35 times. So, in the Old Testament, or First Testament, Evil is just really low-key, the adversary, now and then. But in the, in the Gospels, evil is, is prominent. Satan is an obstacle, and the devil is 37 times the enemy. Okay. So those are questions that I have, but we'll get to the, those texts a little bit later. Let's move to the next two, with, which are Matthew. And here we see Jesus' attitude toward evil. Not his healing, 
but his attitude. Matthew 5. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God sort of treats, or through Jesus, treats everybody, our Father in heaven, he says, God treats everybody the same. We don't have to like that, but we may have our own ideas of what evil is in the New Testament or the Gospels. And the next one is the parable of the weeds and the uh, weeds uh, and the um, wheat. And it's a long parable, but we know that a, a person goes out to, to seed and wheat starts to grow and then weeds start to grow and the owner comes out and asks the master, should we pull up the weeds? Because that's like the evil spirits. That's like the bad thing. Weeds are not good. Unless you're smoking them, I guess. But anyway. Um, so, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? Mm, that's a question, isn't it? No, it doesn't get answered. He said, well, an enemy did this. Who's that? What's the source? An enemy. <coughs> Maybe it's a Satan. A diabolos, a devil. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell you, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be uh, burned and gather the wheat into my barn. So Jesus' attitude is, well, the Gospels apparently are not about defeating evil. Let us conclude. The Gospels are not about defeating evil. Let them grow together until the judgment day. You can ask why. There's sermons on why. And I'd like to linger on every one of these, but we hear the attitude of Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, as we've gone through the first four texts for now, is God's divine plan not to remove evil? That's what it, the question begs, right? Not until Judgment Day, so it's here. And why not? Why not try to defeat it? It didn't, didn't um, the people who opposed Antiochus, weren't they, the, the Qumran people, weren't they trying to defeat evil? Wasn't there a dualism here? I mean, you had this whole book of Enoch and influencing all of this in the Gospels. What is God's divine plan? Does it include evil? That's the questions that this, this, is there a purpose of evil? So we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of sermons on, the, on all of these texts, actually. So I wanted you to see that Jesus does individual healing of people who are possessed of the demon or have physical ailments and we, lots of stories. And we see Jesus' attitude, um, which is, it's here. Just assume evil is. Not going to tell you where it came from. I don't know. Not going to tell you its nature. We can see it, right? We can see that evil is real in the way it manifests itself. Okay, so we go from any questions? Are you with me? Could you say a few words about the temptation? Oh, the temptation of Jesus. Well, that's kind of important, isn't it? Yeah, in fact, um, I was thinking of that. I, I don't have it written down to talk about, but I was thinking about it during your sermon. Uh, and get thee behind me, Satan, too, um, for um, Peter. And, of course, Jesus is tempted by Satan in the desert. 
And I know I've talked with you about it in other lectures as uh, Jesus having self-doubts, being tempted, like the last temptation of Christ uh, by Cousin Zonkis, of, of having intrusions on, am I ready to take on this mission? But is Satan real in this? I mean, that's, that's a matter of our beliefs next to Jesus, isn't it? Because people today still believe in the devil, you know. Fundamentalists believe in the devil. So we're not just looking at, at um, consciousness over time. We're looking at people uh, who, haven't, um, who haven't changed their thinking. And that's really an important thing to say. But I don't know. You have an idea? I mean, that you want to share. I'm sure you have ideas. <laughs> no, no, you, you carry on. OK. So Satan can be a real figure, or Satan can be inner temptations, that which tempts us. Get thee behind me, Satan. Obviously, Peter wasn't a devil or a demon. So it meant, don't tempt me. Don't be an obstacle to my moving forward, to my calling. Probably the same as with Jesus. I don't want you to interfere with these temptations, which are fabulous. Their power, their, their glorification. I don't want these things, which are stumbling blocks, scandalon in the New Testament. Don't be a scandalon, which means obstacle. But also in the Hebrew scriptures, um, uh, Satan becomes an obstacle. So scandalon and and Diabolus or Satan mean the same thing. What's that word? Which word? Scandalon. Scandalon. It's a Greek word for obstacle in the, in the Gospels. How would you spell it? Scandalon. S K A N D Scand A L A L O N, I think. Yes. Yes. Someone who knows said yes. Okay, that was a good guess for me, just like Moby Dick. Okay, um, so we move from the Gospels. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Stop. I just uh, am curious about the personification of evil in the form of Satan and how that fits in with more of a psychological approach to understanding evil. Yeah, well, it doesn't yet. And that's you the mean answer. At this time frame. Yeah, it's in a different time frame. Job has the personification of Satan as a figure, but not in not in the gospels, unless it's the temptation of Jesus, where Satan actually is a personification there in the text, but not until later. Other questions before we move on? Okay. So we move on from the Gospels to the Church Fathers. We did Augustine. That's all we're going to do. And Tertullian, who says that all women are Eve. Okay, so we have this uh, misogyny that carries forth even uh, through today. And from there, we go to your other handout, I guess. I have it here. To, um, to the fall of Rome, okay, we have the Council of Nicaea where orthodoxy gets set. So the beliefs get set, okay, um, in the uh, 14, 4th century. And then we move to the Christian Middle Ages. I don't think if you look that up, it might Google anything. But it's the Middle Ages run by Christendom. And I can see already we're not going to get where I want to go today. So we're going to give it a, a haul here. So the Middle Ages, and I, I like to say it this way, the, the Middle Ages uh, become Susa, the place of personification. Okay. If it's before that, it is in, like I said, in the, in the Gospel with Satan, uh, with Job. Um, but it really gets personified uh, by putting the face of evil on people. Okay, so the Middle Ages, and I, and I like to say it this way, I'm going to teach it differently than any history class would. 
from a theological perspective. Why is it called the Dark Ages? You know, I look at a word like enlightenment, and I think, wouldn't that be great? Christendom? The Age of Enlightenment. But it's not. It's the Age of Darkness. Why? Why? And I think the whole time, God is asking, why? Why? And here we have the church state. And some things that I need to bring out that you know about this period are the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the personification of Muslims, <laughs> Jews, and women as witches, burned at the stake, all heretics, all of those who didn't follow the orthodoxy of Christendom from, from Nicaea, this orthodoxy, were condemned. And I'm just going to say they're murdered. Witches are murdered. Jews, what happened to Jews? Personification of evil coming from the book of Job, Job, who calls Jews the devil. So we're not going to get to that until next week as much. So what happens is, in these uh, days, this thousand years, or almost a thousand, we have the other, and that's an important thing, the other is the devil. <clears throat> Not me. Now, Jews lived in little communities surrounded by Christians. They were constantly harassed, tortured. Good Friday, they had to lock their doors because they killed Christ. And that's an early church father. We're looking at, I think, as far back as Origen, who said they're Christ killers. So we have another stream of thinking going through um, our church from the fathers, from our scripture through the church fathers, to modernity that isn't looking, that is trying to define evil without looking at its own manifestations along the way. Only in hindsight. And so there's a church schism. I think this is so incredible. Uh, in the 13th, uh, 1300, 1378 to 1470, where there were two popes. It's a schism that came in the church. One said, uh, the Pope of uh, Avignon said, I'm the Pope, and the Pope in Rome said, I'm the Pope. And so what happened was, because the church wanted to keep its people safe from evil, which are witches and Jews and other, it started to compete with each other who could burn the most witches. Mm -hmm. So there were 40,000 burned on this side, then 60,000 burned on that side, because if you could burn more witches and provide more protection, you would join that church. So this is the kind of, of thing in hindsight, that's why the hindsight line is there for you. In sign, hindsight, we look back and we say, wow, uh, that was evil. Now the Black Death came almost around, or a little bit earlier, uh, but into that time, actually, um, was 1347, so in the Dark Ages. Unfortunately, huh? Or is it fortunately, the Black Death came, then a third of the population dies, and doubt comes into uh, Catholics, which is all there is. And they start to doubt the clergy because the clergy aren't able to get rid of uh, the Black Plague or stop it from spreading. Oh, where is God? Where is the church? It has all the power. It runs every bit of our lives. Now there's the indulgences. There's rampant corruption within the Catholic Church. Now, Claire was saying, well, there were good things too. And I said, well, I guess maybe um, there was, I guess. Um, but you never read about those, do you, when you read about the Middle Ages, what the church did. So I suppose there was some good things that happened, um, and people believed. But there was, a, there was never doubt allowed, and never questions were tolerated. No questions. And it's the Dark Ages because there was no intellectual learning. Just the Bible, just with the church, nothing else. So here's how I want to end this section. 
not too many weeks to just figure this out. That's really ridiculous, you know. It takes me so long. I have to understand everything I'm telling you, that's why. But I have to tell you that what happens next, I think, from a supernatural perspective, not a historical one, but yes, a historical one, because God works in history, that God says, Oy vey. <laughs> Oy vey. That's a church doing. And he says, it's about time I let out the rest of my brain. I love that because God did not give me many parts of his own brain. And God said, I got it. I got it. How to get out of this and bring about something that is really good for people and good for God and God's creation. God invented the printing press. <laughs> That's how I like to look at this. I mean, right out of the Middle Ages comes the Reformation. Right? Oh, there were, there were all kinds of, think of good things happening, all kinds of, of people during uh, the time of Christendom in the Middle Ages that wanted church reform. John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, some of them burned at the stake. You could not doubt, you could not question. And Luther came along right at a pivotal moment where they were, gonna, they were looking for him too. He was not safe on the road until Prince Frederick put him behind his back. Okay, and the printing press came out and Luther just said, yeah, wow. And the 95 theses were just spread out. And what happened from that, what happened from the Reformation? Let me back up, because when I think of this oy vey and the printing press, I think of the fall of communism in 1989. In 1994, I go to Poland with a couple of Jewish friends from Australia. Born in Poland, born in Israel, living in Australia. And uh, to the chagrin of my mother, who thought I was going on a luxurious vacation, we were going to see Auschwitz and all the death camps and find out where Adam's family had lived before he left and, and migrated to Israel. We're, we're doing this, and then we're sitting in a car. We went to, rented a driver to drive us all over. I mean, the communism fell doesn't mean something immediately sprung up. And suddenly he puts a, a cassette in the player in the car. And I hear, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he looks back and he says, you guys heard of the Beatles? <laughs> 1994, and we looked at each other like, that's what this means. And this is what you have with the Reformation. The church is no longer in power. It still has some because things overlap. But it loses some of its power. There's a counter-Reformation. Um, there's freedom of expression, that's the Reformation. There's a break in the church's power. The devil loses its personification in a big way, but still carries on uh, through our history in smaller ways, but still carries on. And then you find all other kinds of things that I think God is saying, right on, right on. Copernicus. And this is really, I, what I want to call this, and I, I will give credit to Claire for this, and she said, uh, and so I'm going to use it as um, th the three slaps to the church. And, and, I, and I think they're kind of great. 1543, so Copernicus discovers the earth huh, revolves around the sun. Why is that such a bad thing to discover that? That you're actually put on trial. Maybe excommunicated. Galileo during this period. Why? Because, first slap against Genesis, the planet is puny. And it's really insignificant. God created the earth. And we're, it's the center. And when you have all of these other things going on out there, where is the heavenly host? Slap number two. Then come Darwin. You weren't created in an instant. 
What? Adam and Eve? And the church is against Darwin because we evolved? We're not special? We're not special and God created Adam and Eve. Wow. And I think God is up there saying, go, go, go. <laughs> because this is part of who I am. I created these things. This is the universe I created. These are the way things are supposed to go, and this is how you're supposed to discover them. And so you have the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, and you have freedom and reading and books and countries collaborating now with science and scientific um, discoveries. Yo. All the fruits of the tree of knowledge. All the fruits of the tree of knowledge. Oh, Tyler. I'm not used to such wisdom from you. What? <laughs> ah. Very good. I, I actually like that. Yeah. That's daddy and mommy saying, you know, don't eat that. Okay. I don't know what to do with that except that's, that's cool. I like that. And I think what happens here then, can I get to it, um, is, and that's why I'm shortening up here, because we're looking at the shifts, the continuation of consciousness widens and opens at this point to astrology and astronomy and anatomy and to looking at the into the into the body all the sciences all literature art everything opens up and it's like have you heard of the beatles before cuz that's what's happened the world has opened up and people are enjoying study conversations, reading. And now you see the church doesn't have a hold on burning manuscripts that can't be replaced without three years work. And the church loses at this. It starts to burn books that can be replaced. And so where I want to go from here, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna at least start it, because I want to get through these texts. Um, go back to your texts. What I want to go to at this moment is science comes into its own field. Empiricism, proof, measurements. It is not interested itself in evil. Because evil can't be measured. Evil isn't rational. It happens, it exists. And not only that, the philosophers that come out at this time are not interested in evil. Guess what they're interested in? Long writings, long discourses. They're interested in what is good. Kind of cool, huh? What is good? But evil takes a back seat. It isn't, it isn't something rational, and it can't, be, it can't be measured. And then comes someone along in science, Sigmund Freud. And now we're going to get into something that I think God had in mind to be discovered so that we could understand more, although we do backslide and we get there next week. And so Freud is the one who, I'm not sure if discovered or he discovered what was, he didn't invent it. He said, we have in our brains a consciousness and an unconsciousness. And he called the unconsciousness of instinct, where you no know, sexual stuff goes down there, and instinct goes down there, some automatic things that go down there, too, like reactions. And, but that's what we get from it. It's a repression of something. And he says, but this is science, because the scientists say, this isn't science. But he gets, he gets away with it in this age. And he says, but, but it is. I can tell by the dreams people have what's in the unconscious. That, that I, can, I, can, I can prove this. And by the slips of the tongue. Remember, that's Freud. Huh? Freudian slip? That tells what's down there that you just didn't know was there. But then along comes Carl Jung. And Carl Jung is really a student of Freud for a while. And then Freud does to Jung what the other scientists did to him. And once, once Jung gets into the, un, the consciousness and unconsciousness, 
and start talking about the shadow. Now, we've talked about that before, right? Some of us know Jungian stuff. And, and Freud <coughs> says, oh, this isn't science. Yeah. And Jung breaks away. And Jung does something that helps us in the study of the mind to understand Jesus better and what was said by Jesus in a deeper, more profound way than it was said at the time. And I really need to say this, too, um, about Freud, the beginning of psychiatry, psychotherapy, it was not well taken in this country by anybody. Lay people didn't like it. They, they, they were sort of like, well, what is this? The church did not like it in this country. I mean, it took a long time for this to become something that the church said, oh, maybe this can help. And, and just to put it, summarize it, um, one, one priest said, you know, in psychotherapy, you confess everything, but you don't get absolution. But the church, you confess and you get absolution. Why would you go to a therapist? <laughs> and, and the issue there is a misunderstanding of what psychology is and what it can do and how it can help. And so, um, is that correct? No, there's no way of going. It's really noon, right? Okay. So let's go back here because I want to take you to what Jung does because he has a few concepts that I said already. There's the consciousness, what we're aware of, the unconsciousness, where the shadow lives. That he defines as what is unwanted thoughts, denied thoughts, unacknowledged thoughts. In other words, he says what the Middle Age Christendom said. The other is evil out there. And now Jung says, actually, the other is in your shadow. It's in you. It's in you. Now the shadow can have good things in it that you repress and don't want, as, as well as things that need to be integrated. So that the goal is to become whole, which we see is the goal then of Jesus. Now I'm not, I'm not going to advocate yes or no in this. There are people today, churches still today, who say that psychiatry, psychology, all this stuff is garbage. The pastor is enough. But you see, the church always knew that we had a dark side. It's always known that. And it dealt with it through confession and forgiveness. But what were you confessing? What you knew? What you did? And then, You'd get the absolution and forgiveness, and nothing changed. And next week, you're confessing the same thing. Well, try harder. Well, geez. So I can get forgiveness again, but you know, I, I can't stop doing what I'm doing. And so psychology said, we can help so that, yes, you know, forgiveness is possible, which means a change, a real change. So let's go to some texts, and maybe we'll just do a few, and I'd like to give a, a whole session on this, but of course, on almost all of it. So let's go to, Jay, you mentioned Luke today, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew. Matthew, sorry. And I think, um, when we hear the word perfect, what do you think of? I think of monk. <laughs> you know, everything's lined up, everything is in its right order, every hair is in place, and this is kind of, you know, it takes OCD to be perfect. Perfect means without blemish. Hmm. But, the Greek word for perfect here has no, does not come anywhere close to that. Perfect means Completed. Complete. Complete means whole. Be complete. Be whole. Like your Father in heaven is whole. Well, how do you do that? I mean, it's hard enough to try to without blemish. <laughs> right? 
I mean, whatever we think perfect looks like. But how do I become whole? So thanks for bringing that up. It's one I could have added and I think about all the time. Um, and so let's just go down to Matthew 23, the second from the bottom of the first page. And we know this. So this is the woe to the scribes and Pharisees. And hypocrite's a good word, okay, because that means you're not being honest. So again, it's a lie, okay, deception. For you are like washed, whitewashed tombs. You know, you're beautiful on the outside. You look really great. You know, and when you're amongst us here, you're like a pillar. Look at, look at you. I mean, just, you know. What a pillar of the church. We know, we know what that is. We know what it is to look good, to act moral, although we don't know your secret life. Okay, but you look great, and you dress right, and you look holier than thou. Okay, but inside, you're full of bones of the dead, and all kinds of filth. So, we're no longer looking out there, are we? We're looking in here. And this is what Carl Jung calls, and it's really about drama, you put a mask on. This is what you look like, it's called a persona. This is my role. I mean, you know, it's kind of nice when people would, would uh, you know, you look at a priest and you think, oh wow, holy, 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 you know and acts so proper, so much so you're afraid to talk to him. Because he's just not, not human, you know. And, and I loved it when I was a chaplain and I, I did differently than expected. The persona is what people expect. And then one woman says, you call yourself a chaplain? Well, oh, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, this is what it looks like if I'm not a hypocrite. This is what it looks like. That's why we like Jay. That's why you can't get an appointment with him. <laughs> I'm guessing that's true. Anyway, um, he's like real. You know, be authentic. Be authentic. People like it when you're authentic. So you're not authentic. You're hypocrites. And you know what it leads to? Let's just go to the next one. So this is a long parable, so I'm not a story, so I'm not going to read it all. Do you remember when, when Jesus is invited? to the house of a Pharisee. He goes and he sits at the table. It's reclining, is the way of sitting then. And a woman comes in, had followed him, and is washing his feet. And the Pharisee says to him, well, if you knew who this woman was, you wouldn't let her do that. You'd rebuke her. And so Jesus gives him a little parable and says, um, you know, if you, if, if you owe, if two people owe this guy money, and you have a lot that you owe him, and he has a little, but you're both forgiven, who will appreciate him more? And he says, yeah, obviously the bigger debt that's, that's relieved. And he said, therefore, for her sins, which are many, are forgiven. But you, you whitewashed tomb, you haven't done anything wrong, you hypocrite. Inside, you're full of all kinds of things you haven't been able to admit. You can't put forward, you can't face, you don't acknowledge, because you like that persona. And so Jesus says, yeah, you know, if you would just admit stuff that's inside of you and ask for forgiveness, you also would, and Jay's going to love this, you also would know love. You also would know compassion. She sinned much, she acknowledged, she knows who she is, and she can show love and compassion. I'm gonna stop right now. I had more, um, but um, we'll pick up next week, and I don't know if we need more young, I might just uh, summarize him a little bit. He's not the end all, it doesn't have the final answer. But we see where science is able to help us move forward in consciousness and in wholeness in terms of our faith, which is what we're looking at. And we will continue to look at evil and, and uh, the movement towards 
um, consciousness. Thank you. Thank you.